Hey everyone, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and Pastor Brademeyer is back today to help us think philosophy, right? How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, we, we survived a little traumatic incident this morning with my daughter, but uh, life is life is good. It's just a little trauma. Walk it off. Um, <laughs> we are going to be talking about uh, epistemology today, right? Yep, that's the plan. All right. I don't know how to spell that or, or what it means, so you're going to need to sort of help me out just a little bit. Well, I think Siri can help you with the spelling. You don't need me for that. You, you, she can probably do that. But epistemology is basically how we study what we know. Right? It deals yeah. with knowledge, where we come, where knowledge comes from, how we get to it. Is it reliable? These are the kinds of things we look at in epistemology. And so, like, you know, basic questions would be, how can we come to know that something is true? Um, what constitutes true things? What is a fact, right? Um, what are we capable of knowing? What are we not capable of knowing? What's the difference between a, um, a truth statement and an opinion, right? And, and I know like in my, my uh, local school here, my kids, they uh, bring home lessons where they're supposed to go between, you know, facts, truth statements, and opinions. And that really seems to be a, a major emphasis in uh, educational uh, offerings these days. I don't, I don't know that I like the way they always break it down, but it is something that's worth knowing because, you know, we have people say stuff all the time, right? Like I can say, boy, I really like the color blue. Well, that's clearly an opinion, mm-hmm. right? You know, because I, I might like, you might like green or whatever. What do you have like favorite color? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a beautiful color. Actually, my favorite color is green. All my kids like blue for some reason. They get that from their mother. But uh, anyway, so, you know, we, get, we have things that are clearly opinion, but then there's other things that sound like they're not opinion, but they're opinion, right? You know, statements of taste. So, you know, you can say this is the best steak. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you saying? Are you really saying that it's got the superior marbling characteristics of a prime steak? Or are you saying you just really like this steak, right? Because right. on the face, it seems to be a truth statement, but really you're just saying, hey, I really enjoyed this steak. Right. You know? And you even have the other side of the coin, especially in the church, uh, where everything that we claim as, as doctrine, as a truth about God is treated as, as an opinion. So Jesus rose from the dead and that's not met with, well, that's just like your opinion, man. It, it either happened or it didn't. Right. That's, that's something too. I've, you know, in fact, I just had a conversation this week with a couple different people um, who are not really going to church. You know, they both grew up in the church, but not really going to church. And, and that came up in one of the conversations, um, you know, well, why do you believe this stuff? You know, why do you believe in a six day creation and all these sorts of things that, you know, are kind of weird and don't seem to make sense because they don't teach that in school in the science book. And I said, well, it all goes back to this guy, Jesus, who really existed in history and he really rose from the dead. And this is how he talked about it. And given that he's God and rose from the dead, I, I guess I can take him seriously when he says Adam and Eve are historical people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, it all hinges on that. You know, that's that's the one of the weird things about being a Christian is that we claim our religious truth in history. It's not this abstraction. You know, you can find a lot of religious systems, especially amongst the spiritual and not religious, where it's like these profound sayings that you can ponder and they like might mean something or whatever, you know, you get real Zen about it, right? What is the sound of one hand clapping or whatever? And um You know, and and so sure, you can maybe figure out some stuff or at least think you do. But the fact is, is that we are making a very bold claim that our religion is actually rooted in real historical reality. And therefore, everything, you know, revolves around that. I mean, it all goes back to Jesus. You know, as one person I have talked to recently, I'm, you know, I mentioned the reason we Christians are called Christians and not like Gaudians or whatever is because everything centers on Christ. And he is a real man in real history. And he's also God. Therefore, when he speaks, we listen, because this is where God reveals his face, right? God doesn't want us to go kind of ignore Jesus and try to find him some other way. He wants us to find him through Jesus, because that's where he put on flesh for us to know him. And, you know, suddenly all, all of the things we say about religion, is it just like a, hey, man, what do you, you know, what do you think about it? It's actually there's an objective, true reality to this that we all conform ourselves to. Right. So um, there's two kinds of questions that get asked in Bible studies, and maybe epistemology will sort of help me sort through it. Uh, I I get the the catechism ones, the what does this mean? But I also get the sort of what does this mean to use? Um, How do I sort through the difference between those two things? Well, you know, you have to have a little bit of charity with with people when they ask questions, because I find that, you know, like, I got into trouble recently in town because I I said something on Facebook about rebaptizing that um, rankled a few people because some of the churches in town rebaptize people, which is unbiblical, but they, sometimes people don't like to hear the truth. And anyways, but I got into a long debate with somebody over this and, um, and uh, the person, you know, was like, kept appealing to, what does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? What do you think about this? And I think what they were trying, trying to say 
was, you know, hey, what is the truth here? What does this actually mean? What is the reality here? They just don't have the right words for it. It's like when you, you know, you have your Baptist friend who says, oh, you know, I accepted Jesus into my heart and, you know, I made a decision and, and that's really important in my life of faith. And so it's so important to me that I, I see that as where I actually began my Christian walk or whatever. And uh, that, that might be a statement of false doctrine. They might actually be saying that their faith's in their faith, which is kind of a problem. Or it could be they just don't have the right words to say something. So I guess I would use a little charity and I would just assume that when people say, what does this mean to you? They're just trying to ask, what does this mean? And they just don't have the right words. Because this is how we talk about religion in our society. We make everything into a subjective opinion uh, statement. So, you know, and, and unless somebody really proves otherwise, that's generally how I try to answer the question. You know, I always try to answer it as if they're just saying, well, what does this mean? You know, what is this, what is the truth here, right? Um, but, you know, you're right, though, that is the problem is we turn things that are not opinions into opinions. And this is one of the things I don't like about where my kids' school curriculum goes on this. Um, they teach that, you know, anything that's not verifiable by empirical scientific, you know, research is a by, by definition an opinion. Which is kind of a weird thing to say, because, you know, justice, put that in a test tube, right? Mm. Um, murder, how do, you, how do you empirically verify what murder is? You can empirically verify whether a murder has taken place, but you can't empirically verify murder as a category, or love, mm. or a whole lot of other things, you know? And so it, it's, a, it's a ridiculous statement on its face, but this is the problem. Um, Anyway, so, you know, this is why epistemology is so important, because we need to know what is true. What does it mean to say something is true? How do we come to it? Is it reliable? You know, like one of the other things that, that uh, philosophers of epistemology like to focus on is how reliable is the mind? You know, are my perceptions accurate? Is my memory accurate? When I give you testimony, is it accurate? And there's all kinds of interesting studies that have been done about that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, another question that's interesting to me is um, what is what is axiomatic? And that's now, that's kind of a fancy word, but an axiom, uh, which, you know, if you've ever watched the movie Wally, -E, right, the ship that the humans are on, that's the axiom, right? Um, anyways, the axiom is, is a self-evident proposition. It's just something that's true, and we all recognize it just by its statement that it's true. Okay. So what are the things that are foundational to our pursuit of knowledge that are just true that only, like, crazy people would dare try to refute? That's an important list of stuff to come up with, because most of the things we know are built on foundational ideas we have, right? So an axiom might be that, you know, Gravity is a thing. Okay. Right? It's just self-evidently true. And then I can then derive from that physics and then learn how these forces work and use that in some beneficial way for myself. Even just consistency then would have to be one, right? Like that, that, that I can mm -hmm. do a thing and then the same thing would yield the same result. Right. That, that'd be an axiom. Another one I think is mathematics and kind of its abstract sense. Because, you know, I can teach you by way of experience that an apple plus an apple makes two apples. I don't know why apples are my examples all the time, but I must like them. It's fall. It's, it's apple fall. season, right? Yeah. Your boots <laughs> um, on. But, you know, when I start writing out math problems, one plus one equals two, that's an abstraction. That's not tied to an experience. And yet we all know what that means, right? So that's that's axiomatic because we these things are just true based on what, what ones are. I mean, quantity, you know, you know that I, there's a number of things. That's That's a foundational reality. And so there's all these sorts of things that, you know, we just take for granted and we have to because they're just part and parcel of reality. Um, I, I think that that's I think that's an important place to start. And then, we, of course, we build on that. Um, one of the distinctions that you'll, you'll find, and this is a logical sort of thing, but it's also deals with epistemology. There's two kinds of ways of having knowledge. There's a priori knowledge. That's, you know, a Latin phrase. And there's a posteriori knowledge. And the first one, a priori, means knowledge that's not based in experience. So this would be thing like one plus one equals two or, you know, something like that. Or, or like, you know, you have it is, is something you can derive just by thinking about it. You don't have to like look at a picture or put it in a test tube to figure it out. And then a posteriori, that's knowledge derived from experiential data. So this would be, you know, kind of your scientific method sort of knowledge. And, um, you know, we have that sort of thing. And so what, when philosophers deal with epistemology, they're usually in the first category, at least trying to be except for certain people that reject that the first category even exists and they try to make everything the second category, which is really weird really quickly, um, which I guess brings up to one of the major, unfortunately, major subsets of epistemology today, which is skepticism, mm. right? There's this, this denial and this philosophical attempt to disprove the reality of knowledge and truth altogether, which is really a self-defeating thing because to assert there is no truth is to assert a truth. Right. right. So if I tell you that, that there, you can never know for sure that something is true, well, how do you know for certain that's true that nothing is true? Well, I shouldn't believe you because you just told me not to, right? <laughs> well, that, now we got a problem. Now um, we got a, well, this is, this is, I think, where skepticism, because the modern 
the moderns, you know, modern philosophy starts in like 1650 with a guy named Rene Descartes and it closes out toward the end of the 19th century. And then we've in the 20th century been dealing with what we call postmodernism because we don't know what else to call it. It's just what comes after modernism. But you see this move from this confidence to we can know stuff to we can't know anything. Let's just give up. And it's really interesting to see how that's played out in society, because in the Western world, we're all very skeptical about truth claims, about claims for morality, the claims about rightness of cultures. And you can just see the corrosive effect that's had on family life, on you know, our understanding of society, um, on our, our treatment of authorities, right, and our respect for our leaders. Um, I just had a conversation today in a text study that I do online with uh, about funerals. You know, the one-year lectionary this week, we do with the, the widow's son at Maine. And um, we we're talking about that. And we, we all were observing all the pastors that were there about how people don't respect funerals anymore. You know, people get mad and want to cut off the funeral procession, or they don't want to take time off work to make sure that, you know, grandma's uh, sent to a proper resting place, right? And so, you know, there's this just whole decline in, in dealing with reality because of our skepticism about it. And I, I, you know, as someone who studied philosophy, I can't see these two things as being unrelated, you know, that our cultural ideas about this stuff do have effects in the way that we carry out our lives, which is why, you know, generally speaking, you go to a town who's, who's on boards and helping with things and volunteering as Christians, because we believe in a reality that's coherent and understandable. And that has implication for how we conduct ourselves just in the wider world and community at large. Right. Even just that, that we can say that something is good. I, I assume that there's a, an epistemology that goes with that, like a, a way to sort of think about that. Right. There's, there's you know, an epistemology of ethics, um, which we'll get to when we get to ethics. But yeah, you know, goodness is, is something we can know. At least that's our assertion as Christians. And that's also not in vogue to talk about anymore. Because, you know, when we kind of talk about knowledge in, in contemporary, you know, ta- uh, talking points, we have, you know, kind of science and that's seen as unassailable which is really interesting because when you look at the philosophers who came up with science, as we now understand it, like Thomas Hobbes, for example, they're operating from a place where it's really hard to have certitude, you know, logical certitude. There's only so many things that fall on that list and it takes a lot of work to get there. And you have to think really, really hard about it. And uh, so they go, you know what, let's just give up on that. Let's kind of just be more pragmatic and just kind of go with stuff that works or stuff that's likely it's work in probabilities, you know? And uh, so when you deal with science, there's a reason why in your scientific textbooks, right, it always talks about the scientific method and how we always need to be trying to verify this. And we always need to be trying to clarify this because it's working in probabilities, not in certitudes. And uh, and so but we treat that as if it's certitude when it's not certitude. And that's an interesting thing. And then we get rid of everything else. Right. So we get rid of moral claims and we get rid of like, you know, what's justice? You know, justice used to be people getting what they deserve. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you do good, you're rewarded for your good. And if you do bad, you're, you're punished for it accordingly. And, um, and this fits, you know, with, with who God is, right? Because our ju- view of justice is ultimately derived from our view of God. And, you know, how does God dispense justice? You know, I mean, when we are held accountable to the law, we get what we deserve, which actually doesn't work out very good for us, which thanks be to God, we have Jesus, right? But, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is, you know, an interesting thing, because now we have a whole different theory of justice in our justice system today than we did 100 years ago. Because before it was, you did this, you deserve this. Now it's, well, you know, justice is more about like restoring people and, and helping rehabilitate them and all this sort of thing, which it ends up being not very just because you do a bad thing and you get a reward for it. You know, it is, it's kind of a strange shift that we've made. All right. And, so, uh, oh, good. Oh, I'm just complaining. That's what I like to do. Fair enough. Uh, let, let me ask then, just sort of in brief as we start to close down then, uh, if we were going to have an epistemology, how do we start to separate good from, from a, a bad way of thinking about whether or not things can be true? Are there just sort of a few rules, rules of thumb? All right. So when it comes to thinking about knowledge, you know, and that's the problem with this, because thinking about knowledge means you're using knowledge to think about itself, which is kind of wonky. Um, the first thing is we have to clarify what an opinion is, what a matter, what, opinions are just matters of taste, right? So what an opinion is versus a truth statement. Now, a truth statement needs to be taken as a truth statement and dealt with as a truth statement. Even if it turns out not to be true, you still have to treat it like it's a truth statement, right? So, um, you know, for example, murder is bad is not a matter of taste. That is a truth statement. Now, it may be the case that I'm speaking incorrectly, that I'm actually wrong about that, but it's still a truth statement. It needs to be treated accordingly. And so it's, it's actually really condescending when people come to you and you say, you know, God is real, which is a truth statement. And they're like, hey, man, that's, you know, that's just your opinion or whatever. That's not an opinion. I'm not asserting it as an opinion. I'm saying it's a truth statement. It should be dealt with accordingly. Mm-hmm. Saying, you know, I like God. That's a matter of taste. Right. Right. 
I'm telling you what I think about it. And so I think you keeping that clear is the long, first step. But yeah, you can't just sort of quantify it as an opinion that I don't have to deal with. And that's the nice right. part about an opinion, right? If it's just your opinion, I don't have to deal with it. Yeah, because opinions have no purchase on me. And that's right. one of the ways that you can tell if something's an opinion or not. If I say, you know, steak is my favorite thing, that doesn't really affect you at all. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's weird, too, because we've so confused opinions and facts that you'll get people who will be like, I prefer Nike over Adidas. And they're like, dang, you're getting into fisticuffs over it, you know, or I like the Vikings more than the Packers. And you'll have, you know, barroom brawls after the game or whatever. I mean, which is strange because we're not taking opinions and trying to assert them as truth statements. And, you know, yeah. this is this is a bizarre thing that we do, but we have to keep that straight. I think that's the first step. Okay. And the second thing is, is that we have to make sure that we understand that knowledge has to be coherent. Right. So this thing must lead to this thing must lead to that thing. It can't just be um, stuff that pops up out of nowhere for no reason. Um, If it's incoherent, it's not really it's either not a knowledge claim and a matter of opinion or it's just bad thinking. And we need to actually take time to straighten it out. Okay. no, those are helpful. So these are things to kind of chew on then as we we start to go about our day. Are people mixing up truth and opinion and and, and are the things that, that are given as truth something that sort of actually leads to something else concrete? Right. Fantastic. All right. Well, that's that's a lot to chew on. Pastor Brademeyer, thank you so much for joining us on the Drive to School. Well, it was my pleasure to be here. Hey, have a good one. You too.